Habakkuk and Hosea. In Hosea chapter 6, we have a prophetic utterance of the prophet Hosea concerning Israel. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. After how many days? Two days. See, 2,000 years. That's the end of the church age. From Christ to the end of the church age, 2,000 years. And the third day, he will raise us up, and we'll live in his sight. That's the millennium. There's your 2,000 year period of the church age, and the Three days. Now, listen to this. In the scripture, when Jesus was 12 years old, he went with his family to the Passover feast at Jerusalem. They thought he was with them when they left. They went a day's journey out. And they found out he was not with them. They turned around and went back. If it's a day's journey out, it's a day's journey back, isn't it? Now, his family was Jewish, wasn't it? So the Jews were without Jesus two days. Hosea said, after two days, he will revive us. See, the very things that happened in Jesus' childhood reflects the composite drawing. Now, the third day, they found him in the temple. They were without him two days, but the third day, they found him in the temple. Zechariah 6 says, Jesus will build the millennial temple, and that's where he'll rule from during the millennial, in the millennial temple. Now, Jesus was in the temple area, and uh, they said, you better depart, for Herod will kill you. He said, go tell that fox, I do cures today and tomorrow. Two days. The third day will be perfected. Now, folks, there are too many witnesses in the scripture that reveals the length of the church age. Now, like I say, you, you can't set a date. Uh, it's foolish to try to set dates. If I could tell you the day and the hour when Jesus is going to appear to catch away the saints, you still wouldn't know. The scripture says no man knows the day nor the hour. But do you realize that only covers a 24-hour period? The day or the hour? So it is theoretically possible we could know within a day when he's coming. Gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Jesus went down to Samaria, talked to the woman at the well. And uh, she, a lot of people came and they believed on him. And they besought him to stay with them. And he abode with them. Now, Samaria is a Gentile city. And he abode with the Gentiles two days. Now, folks, that's not a coincidence. Jesus lived out the prophetic word. They're prophetic events that was lived out in Bible history. Just the same as the seven feasts to the Lord that God commanded Israel to rehearse year after year represented the seven appointed things that would happen in the 7,000 year period. The first four have been fulfilled. He fulfilled the feast of the Passover. He became the Passover lamb. His body was buried, which is a type of unleavened bread, broken for us. And then he became the first fruits. God raised him from the dead on the third day. He became the first fruits, fulfilled it. Then the next appointed time was Pentecost, and God fulfilled that by sending the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. The next event that Israel rehearsed all through history until they got scattered was the appointed time of the trumpets. That is the very next event to transpire in history. And it is no doubt, most probably, the rapture of the church. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised, they who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So over and over again in the scriptures, you see it time and time again, time and time again. <clears throat> now let's go to the rapture. Go with me to... Let me take you mentally to some of these because we can shorten some by doing that. Somebody said, glory to God. <laughs> if we can shorten. 
in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That there, where I am, there you may be also. Now, there's people today that teach that there is no rapture, that God's not going to take the righteous out of the earth. He's going to take the wicked off. Well, now, there's some truth to that, but the problem is they got it in the wrong sequence. God's going to take the righteous out first, which is typified by Noah being caught up before the judgment of God came upon the earth, without a doubt. But there's an interesting thing that happened in the book of Chronicles. Now, if you'll just write this down and read it later. In the book of Chronicles, the fifth chapter, God had told Solomon, had the commission to build the house of the Lord. Now, when the house was finished, now remember, Jesus said, I go away and prepare a place for you. If I prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, there you may be also. Some people teach that we're going to get everything under control. Jesus is going to come down here and rule and reign with us down here. And we're not going to heaven. But Peter said, in 1 Peter, he said, there is reserved for us in heaven, a reward in heaven, reserved in heaven for us. Now, if we don't go up there, what good would it be to us if we don't go there together? And besides that, Revelation 19, we come back with Jesus when he comes back from heaven. How did we come back with him if we were not up there with him? The problem is they've inserted some things in the wrong places in the prophetic puzzle. But when they celebrated the house of the Lord being finished, they had 120 priests that blew 120 trumpets and they were clothed with white linen and had harps. 120 priests blowing 120 trumpets and every year for the Jubilee year, every 50th year, they blew the trumpet and declared a year of Jubilee. Represents 120 Jubilees, total time Jubilee 120 and the house of the Lord is finished. It's time to bring them home. Now, you may not believe this, but when I began to teach this, I went home one day and, and, and I started to drive in the garage and I looked at my tag, the car tag, and I almost fell out. My car tag is TTJ120. I told my wife, I said, I believe the Lord has given us a revelation. Now, I've had that tag for some time. And I just started preaching this, and I noticed that tag, total time jubilee, 120. Now, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> now, that'll make little doodads run up and down your spine, you know. <clears throat> Goodness. <clears throat> By the way, when they, when they blew those trumpets, a cloud came down in the place where they couldn't even stand. And see, we're going to be caught up in a cloud to meet him in there. Folks, there are composite drawings all through this word of God that validates time and time and time again. These segments of time are spelled out in the word of God. Anybody that'll take the time to study it beyond the doubt could be able to see it. The same as if they'd studied the prophetic word of old, they'd known the exact day Jesus was going to be crucified. They would have known the exact day that, that uh, Pharaoh was going to let them come out of Egypt because it was prophesied hundreds of years before. When the decree was sent forth to rebuild Jerusalem, see, God said it'll be 490 years that he's going to deal with Israel. From the time of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah is cut off or crucified will be 483 years. Now, when, when they got out of Babylon, the prophet took the prophet Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, I believe it was Isaiah that prophesied it, and took it to Cyrus the king and showed him where Isaiah prophesied 200 years before that there'd be a man come into power named Cyrus that would send out a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. 
And he was so impressed, he set out the decree. <clears throat> and 483 years from the exact day that he sent out the decree, they crucified Jesus. God's time clock is on schedule and it's ticking. Somebody said, how close is it? Well, I'll have to tell you a story to tell you how close it is. This guy hit a base run and slid into first base, and the umpire said, two. Somebody said, what do you mean two? He said, too close to call. And that's where we are, too close to call. Go to First Thessalonians. <clears throat> now you might wonder, you might say, well now, why, why didn't Jesus give us great revelation? I see he did allude to some things and gave us some insight. But why didn't Jesus talk more about the rapture of the church? His ministry was to the Jews. The Jews didn't receive him. Why would he talk to the Jewish, the people that didn't believe in him about being raptured? They won't be raptured if they don't believe in him. But do you know where we get most of our revelation concerning the rapture of the church? From the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter who were apostles to the Gentiles. Paul said, I didn't, what I'm teaching, I didn't learn it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So he got his revelation direct from Jesus. Now Jesus said, there's many things I would say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They couldn't understand it in that day. There's things that you couldn't understand 10 years ago that you can understand now. There's people that taught a few years ago that, that the two witnesses, when they're raptured, that, that all the world won't see them. It's impossible for all the world to see them because it'd just be the people in that area. But you see, through via satellite, CNN will be there, ABC will be there, CBS will be there, Dan Rathers and, and all of these newsmen will be there. And, and they'll be raptured right on national television, satellite to the whole world. And besides that, the coming of Jesus will be on television. That Hubble telescope can look 16 million miles into space. 16 billion, I believe it is, something like that. You don't think that's just a stargaze, do you? The Bible says the door opened in heaven, and when they do, they'll probably have that Hubble telescope up that way, and they'll say, my Lord, what is this? It looks like a bunch of people riding white horses. <laughs> well, I guess you realize I'm excited about this. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, verse 1, I mean, chapter Chapter 4, verse 13. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him when he comes. Now let me explain that, because some people say, oh yeah, when, when he comes back, you see, from heaven in Revelation 19, he's going to bring the spiritual bodies of those that have died in Christ with him. That's not what he's referring to. Let me point it out to you. The spiritual body, see, Paul said to be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. In our day, when you die, instantly you're in the presence of the Lord. Your spiritual body is. Your, your physical body goes in the grave. They put it in the coffin, they bury that thing. And it'll stay there till the resurrection, till, till Jesus appears. And uh, we'll read it here in just a minute. But you see, your spiritual body will be up there. There's a spiritual body and there's a physical body, Paul said. You can read it in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter so Jesus, when he appears in the clouds, he doesn't come to the earth at that time, he appears in the air, and he will bring the spiritual bodies of those that are dead and in the grave with him there. And notice what it says, For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
and we, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those dead bodies will come out of the grave, they will ascend first, and we will be caught up with them, and they will be reunited with their spiritual bodies and will be made glorified bodies the same instant we are changed. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Now notice here, thief in the night. Second advent. I'm not talking about the, the uh, rapture of the church. For when they shall say. Now notice he says, you have no need that I write unto you these things. Things concern times and seasons. Why? Because they would be the dead in Christ. And brother, when it happens, they're out of here. But when they shall say, notice, it goes from you to they. Who's they? They that are on the earth during the tribulation period. When they shall say peace and safety, then shall sudden destruction come upon them as upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Oh, but the scripture says, in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, Pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. Here it says they won't escape. Those on earth won't escape. We're not on earth at that time. We escape before these things come upon the earth. But ye, brethren, are not of darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. See, we're not of darkness. It won't overtake Christians as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, the children of the day, not of the night, nor of darkness. Now come on down to verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation, the hope, blessed hope of deliverance. Deliverance from what? The next verse tells you. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation or deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ. The tribulation period is called the wrath of God upon the unbeliever and upon the wicked world. We are not appointed to wrath. Now come with me over to 2 Second, Second Thessalonians. Now in 2 Thessalonians, somebody had evidently written a letter and signed Paul's name to it, forged his name and said that Paul had changed his mind, that the rapture had already taken place and the day of Christ or the day of the Lord was at hand. Now, Paul's trying to straighten this mess out in, in chapter 2. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That refers to the second advent. But the next part of the sentence refers to the rapture. And by our gathering together unto him. Now, the reason he speaks of them both in the same sentence is because he's trying to show the difference and, and uh, that they don't come in the sequence that somebody's trying to say they do. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. Two things must absolutely happen before the second advent. See, he's trying to counteract that letter that somebody sent out and said, all oh, the rapture's past, and the day of Christ is at hand, or the day of the Lord. He says it can't possibly happen that way because the two things must absolutely happen first. One is translated here, falling away, and the man of sin be revealed. Now there's people that'll tell you today that we're in the tribulation today. The man of sin, which is the Antichrist, has not been revealed. He cannot be revealed until the church is taken out because we rule the darkness of this planet. We are the restrainer. Now, the word that's translated to falling away here is the word apostasia. That word means a removing. Now, the reason it's translated to falling away is it, back there when this was translated, they did not have the revelation of what Paul was saying. The revelation is time release. But if you will follow me here, I can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you'll take the word of God for it, that this does not mean a wholesale backsliding. It means the removal of the church from planet Earth. In 
In fact, if you have an Amplified Bible, some of you have one, you'll notice there's an asterisk there by the words falling away. Now, if you look down at the bottom, there's a footnote down there, and it says a possible rendering of the Greek word apostasia is departure, and then in brackets, of the church. Is that what it says? If it is, wave your hand. That's what it says. See, they knew that it possibly meant that, but they didn't have enough revelation to translate it that. Now, what would a falling away or wholesale backsliding have to do concerning the Antichrist being revealed? No, the restrainer has to be taken out of the way because we are the one that controls the darkness of this planet. When all the Christians leave and there's no one to vote but wicked people, what's going to happen? The wicked will have their way. And notice he goes on to say, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so that he is worshipped, so that he as God, setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now see, he had already talked to them about it. We don't have all that recorded. They knew about this. But now look at verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now what's he referring to here? He just told you back here in verse 3 except there come the departure of the church first. The man of sin revealed the second advent will not take place. So verse 6 refers back to what he revealed in verse 3. Now we know what withholdeth. Why do we know it? He just revealed it in verse 3. It has to be taken out of the way. I come down to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who letteth, now this, this word letteth should be translated hindereth. It's an old English word, the meaning change. It means hindereth. He, only he who hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now what do we got? Here it proves he's talking about the church. He will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now here's where we, you know, may get a sacred cow here. We've been taught for centuries that the church is the body of Christ. <laughs> and that's right. <laughs> that wasn't what I started to say. We've been taught for centuries that the church is the bride of Christ. The scriptures do not ever mention the church as being the bride of Christ. Now, let's take a look very closely at what the Bible says. If, in fact... The church is the bride, then the he can't possibly be the church here. And therefore, it blocks that revelation, and you'll never be under, able to understand what it is that hindereth. Because the word bride is never used of male and female. But the body of Christ is used of male and female. There's no male nor female in Christ. Ephesians says, fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect bride. Oh no, to a perfect man. The church is called a perfect man. Now think with me again scripturally. Jesus is the head of the church, right? We're the body. If the head's a male, the body has to be male or you've got a freak on your hands. Now, I know we're going to have to get over this hurdle here. But see, the scripture is very plain about it. Now, let me give you some other instances. When, when uh, Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, he said, Why persecutest thou me? He didn't say a thing about his bride. Me. He called the church me because the body of Christ is the church. We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. See, for identity's sake, now, now don't misunderstand me. It, it, if you want to use it in relationship, it would probably be all right. But as identity, you have to identify the church as a man or a he for identity's sake. Because Jesus said, why persecutest thou me? He took it personally. The church is him. Now, when you get over to the book of Revelation, you will find in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, it said, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. 
Now, the book of Revelation was written to the church that was to hear this revelation. So it is him that heareth. He calls it a hymn, and it separated the bride from him that heareth. Now, why, why, all the, why, why am I saying all this? Because unless you identify the church accurately, you lose the revelation of who it is that hinders, and it has to be taken out of the way. Now, the very thing that Paul said in Ephesians 5 does not say what most people said it said. He is using the relationship of man and wife. Now, see, my wife and I, we've been married 45 years. She signs her name, Mrs. Charles Caps. We are one. We have one bank account. We own everything together. What she has, I have. We're joint heirs. We're one. We're one with Christ. But yet, her name is still Peggy. So see, she's separate from me, but we are one. And this is what Paul's saying. I speak concerning Christ in the church. Bone of his bone. We are one. We are the body of Christ. Just like she signs her name, Mrs. Charles Caps. we are one. But yet, she is female, and I'm male. But she says, Mrs. Charles Caps. You see the, the illustration Paul's trying to give? It's just showing the difference in identity and relationship. Her identity is she's Mrs. Charles Caps. The relationship, or the relationship uh, is, is separate from identity because her name's still Peggy. And then when you come to the book of Revelation, the chapter, uh, look here in chapter 21. Verse 1, I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and first earth was passed away and there was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now come down to verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven plagues, which talked to me and said, Come hither, and I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now folks, you'll have to have help in this understand that. I'm going to show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It's just talking about symbolism here where Jesus will become, we will become one with him with that city of righteousness. Every move, every thought, everything done in that city will be pure righteousness. Now remember the parable of the ten virgins. None of the virgins were the bride. Isn't that right? In fact, the reason for the marriage was because the bridegroom already had a bride. The virgins were children of the bride chamber, friends of the bridegroom. What they did, they adorned, they went in and decorated the bride chamber. And that's what we find in the book of Revelation it talks about in 19, that that city will be adorned with the white linen of the saints. We will adorn that city with our righteousness. But if you looked in the closet and saw a bridal gown, would you say, my, what a pretty bride? No, that's just what the bride wears. You see, if Jesus, if we're one with him, if he has a bride, we have a bride. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. We will rule and reign with him. Well, I don't want to do overkill here, but I want you to see that, that the identity of the church has to be a man or he, spoken of in the masculine gender, or you lose the revelation of what it is that hinders. Now, notice in, in verse 7 here of Second Thessalonians, <clears throat> He, only he who hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Then the wicked shall be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth. So the Antichrist cannot be revealed, absolutely, Paul says, until the church is taken out of the way. So no need trying to pick the Antichrist. 
because he will not be revealed. Now, if you come back to verse 6, you could apply the pronoun to verse 6. We know what withholdeth. We know he that withholdeth. And it's the same one that's mentioned in verse 3, except there come the departure of the church. You could apply that. See, you can't find in the scripture where there's going to be a wholesale backsliding of the church before Jesus comes. The very opposite is true. We're in a revival right now. So it's very evident from the things that Paul says that we are going to be taken out of the way. Come now with me to Revelation chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Revelation, it mentions the church 19 times. Now catch this, this is significant. Mentions a church 19 times. After chapter 3, the church is never mentioned again in the book of Revelation until you get to the last chapter when it just says these things are written to the church. Now why wouldn't it mention, if the church is on earth during that period of time, why isn't it mentioned? It's mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters. Look here with me in the third chapter. When he talks to the church at Philadelphia, in verse 8 it says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now you remember I said that the, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom? We are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's not just a cloudy day when that happens. That cloud is a cloud of angels that transports the church to heaven. Here he said, because you've not denied my name, kept my word, not denied my name, verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. What's he referring to? The tribulation period. Because you've kept my word. Luke 12, verse 8 and 9, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels of God. The angels are our transport to take us out of here. Now back up. Look at verse 8 again. I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. Now come over to chapter 4, verse 1. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. This is that open door he referred to. I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. The door was opened in heaven. The first voice I heard was as it were a trumpet talking to me. What did it say? Come up hither. And immediately he was at the throne of God. Now folks, that can be nothing but the composite drawing of the rapture of the church. That's the door that he said over here was opened before the church at Philadelphia to keep them from the hour of temptation. The church is taken up Revelation 4.1. It's a composite drawing of it. It's a parallel to it. Then you see the four and twenty elders there worshiping, which represent the Old and New Testament saints. Come over to chapter 5, verse 9. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book open the, uh, and open the seal, for thou, hast, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation, and hath made us to our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Who is this singing this song? It's the church. It's in heaven. And I beheld and heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's 100 billion angels. What are all the angels doing in heaven? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says, Their ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are heirs of salvation. Oh, that's the reason they're in heaven. They've just transported the church to heaven. Another interesting thing. When you get over here to the 14th chapter, we're a little past right at mid-tribulation. And we find the 144,000, you see, that were saved, Jewish men that were saved immediately after the church, immediately after the church is taken out, 144,000 Jewish men get saved. They recognize Jesus was the Christ and they missed him. 
God seals them in the forehead so the Antichrist can't harm them and they preach the everlasting gospel. And they have an assignment to evangelize Israel and the Gentiles during the tribulation period. One of the greatest revivals to hit planet Earth will be during the tribulation period. It starts in this church age but goes right on through the tribulation period. But here in the 14th chapter, we find that the, the 144,000 are in heaven at the throne of God. So there's been a mid-tribulation rapture. That's where people get the idea that we're going up at mid-tribulation. These are mid-tribulation saints. Matthew 24, when it says, uh, talks about the saints in Matthew 24, it's referring to, to uh, it doesn't talk about the saints, it talks about the elect. And people have t- taken that to be the church. No, that's Israel, the elect. That's going through the tribulation. See, there's four elect. Jesus is the elect. The church is the elect. Angels are the elect. And Israel is the elect. You have to determine from the scripture which one it's referring to. And if you get them out of proportion, you get you get hopelessly confused. But here they're standing, uh, this 144,000 are in heaven, singing a song. But now look at verse 6. And I saw another angel fly through the midst of heaven. See, let's back up a little bit. We're in the wrong verse there. Back up to verse chapter 7. In chapter 7, it is still talking about mid-tribulation and, and the 144,000 are there. It continues to give you details, and in chapter 14, the 144,000, they're still talking about them in heaven. But here, verse 11 is the one I want you to see. Now, here the, the uh, 144,000 are in heaven, as we find in verses 9. And, and 10. And all the angels, verse 11 said, all the angels stood round about the throne. Now here again, all of the angels are in heaven. What are they doing in heaven? They came back to the earth and got another load and just transported them to heaven. Interesting thing happens in chapter 14. Do you remember when angel appeared to Cornelius, Acts 10, said, go call for Peter, he'll come tell you what to do. Why didn't the angel preach the gospel to him? Angels can't do that until the church age runs out, until the lease on planet earth runs out. Here in chapter 14, verse 6, and I saw another angel fly through the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Folks, something has happened here. Now angels are preaching the gospel. The lease on planet earth expired. And God can do what he well pleases. And he will. Now the people that say they're going through the tribulation have not understood what the tribulation is about. They preach it and say, well, God's going to protect us from all the things that happened because the three Hebrew children in the fire furnace is a type of us going through the tribulation. Not so. Three Hebrew children is a type of Israel going through the tribulation. Not the church. They were Hebrews, wasn't they? There's only two groups that are protected during the tribulation period. The 144,000 are sealed where Satan, uh, the enemy cannot harm them, the Antichrist. And the two witnesses that show up at mid-tribulation. See, at mid-tribulation, here's what essentially happens. The, the Antichrist has made a covenant with Israel for seven years, just at the time the church is taken out, or right about that time. Folks, that is probably the peace accord they're working on in Israel right now. The Antichrist will honor it and make a covenant with Israel for seven years. In the middle of that seven years, in the middle of that week of years, he will break that covenant and he will set himself up in the temple. See, at around about mid-tribulation, the 144,000 are taken out. They have evangelized the nation of Israel. They're not all saved, but they at least know the truth. And they're caught up into heaven. Now, when they're caught up into heaven, the Antichrist says, oh, I've got it made now. I got rid of them Jews that were preaching this gospel. Now I can do what I want to. So he calls a press conference. He has CNN there. He has ABC, CBS. And he says, I have an announcement to make. 
I am God. The wicked are gone, and I'm the man of peace. I'm God. You worship me. And about that time, two fellows stand up over here, back outside the crowd, and they say, Thus saith the Lord, you're an imposter, and you'll burn in hell forever. Christ is coming to set up his kingdom on earth, and he will rule forever and ever. And he's outraged. He said, get those men and destroy them right here before the cameras. So they rush over there to get the two witnesses, and they just stand there until they get about 10 feet from them, and they go, and they burn them to a cinder. And every man that tries to harm them, that's the way they'll die. For three and a half years, they dogged the Antichrist, prophesying everywhere he go, the king is coming and he's going to set up his kingdom and rule forever. He's an imposter and he can't do a thing about it. <laughs> now he's just announced to the world on nationwide satellite television, I'm God and he can't take two, care of two men. <laughs> he's got problems and they're just starting. But eventually, at the last of the tribulation period, they prophesy for three and a half years. Now, who are the two witnesses? I believe them to be Enoch and Elijah. The reason why is because Enoch was caught up, did not die. Elijah was caught up, he did not die. See, some have supposed it was Moses and Elijah because they showed up on the Mount of Temptation. But Moses died. It's appointed the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Moses can't die twice. And then if you read Luke's account of the Mount of Transfiguration, it said there appeared Moses and Elias in glory and talked of his decease in Jerusalem, talking about Elijah's decease in Jerusalem, not Jesus. Jesus didn't die in Jerusalem. He died outside the city. So we know Elijah's one of them because Malachi speaks of that. So here's... The two witnesses, which I believe to be Enoch and Elijah because neither one of them had died. So they show up there, and when the demons are released out of the pit, they're allowed to destroy, to kill the two witnesses. They die three and a half days before the end of the tribulation period. Now, the CNN's there. They're celebrating. They've got the cameras trained on them. They're giving gifts, celebrating like we celebrate Christmas. And they won't let them move their bodies. They're rejoicing because they have tormented the Antichrist and the false prophets so long. They're rejoicing. But after three and a half days, right in the evening, just before 6 o'clock in the afternoon, see, the Jewish day stops at 6 o'clock. Somebody said, I thought I saw him move. I know I saw him move. <laughs> and they stand up on their feet right on national television. And then rather said, strange things are happening here. Back to you in New York. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and they hear a voice from heaven saying, come up hither. And they ascend right on television, right up to heaven. In the same instant, there's an earthquake and something's happening over here. They turn their cameras over there. White horses? What's that written on his leg? King of kings and Lord of lords. And he sets foot on the mountain and splits in two and shifts and makes a valley all the way to Jerusalem. And the Israelis in Jerusalem flee to the valley. The Antichrist is bringing his armies up the valley of Megiddo, already taken half of Jerusalem, about to annihilate Israel. Just in the nick of time, Jesus shows up and rains fire and brimstone and hail and destroys the Antichrist and all of his armies. See, when he ascended from the Mount of Olives in Acts 1, the angel said, this same Jesus, and remember when he ascended, he was caught up in a cloud. A cloud received him out of sight. Angels transported him to heaven. You remember Jesus said, you will see heaven open and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. When did we ever see that? When he ascended. And you will
will see it when he descends. There are transports. Now here's Jesus. He comes back just in the nick of time to save Israel from annihilation. The Antichrist and his armies are destroyed. There's hail and fire and they turn upon each other. There's so much confusion and blood runs to a horse's bridle for 187 miles down the valley of Megiddo. It's mixed with water because there's a flood of hail and rain and all of it. And that valley was once a swamp until it was drained. But then Jesus, he ascends to the exact spot where he ascended from. That angel said, this same Jesus that you've seen going will so come in like manner. He descends on the exact spot. He will probably walk off or ride that horse right in to the temple mount and call a press conference. Let me read you what he will, what what will be said. <clears throat> well, I can tell it's better than he'll read it. I, we're about to run out of time. <clears throat> Jesus will walk up there, and he'll say, "It has ended. It is finished. I am the King, and I will rule with a rod of iron." The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And there will be righteousness on this planet forever. Once this millennium is over, I will rule for 1,000 years. I am king of kings and lord of lords. Hallelujah. Then he has sent an angel and bind Satan and cast him into a pit for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, there's people who raise children on the earth will be a thousand years old, never been tempted. Satan will be loose for a little season. Go out and gather up all the rebels. Yeah, there'll still be some. And they will be cast into the lake of fire, the devil, the false prophets, and all. And then the wicked dead will be resurrected comes 1,000 years later. And then we will all be caught back up to heaven for the white throne judgment. Now, we won't be judged there, but we will go there to judge angels. And while we're all in heaven at the white throne judgment, wicked, dead, and all, been resurrected, this earth will absolutely burn up, totally and he will fashion a new heaven and a new earth. And then, when the wicked are done away with and destroyed, we will escort that new Jerusalem back to planet earth. God himself and Jesus Christ living in that city, back to this earth, and there will be righteousness on earth forever and ever and ever and never be another rebellion on planet earth. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Blessed be God. And I'm about ready for him to come. <laughs> the wake-up call for the church is the king is coming, and he's coming very soon. Come on, Jerry, I'm going to turn it back to you. Praise God.
chest and 